Hello everybody. Uh, here we go to, with 2.2. So this is our, our ongoing uh, uh, stress uh, lecture so series. So uh, it's a big part of the course and, and obviously stress is highly related to adjustment. So here we go. Behavioral principles applied and of course there's an assignment embedded in this one. So uh, some cats experiencing some stress here. We'll, we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, say hello to Frack. So this is half of our two outdoor cats, Frick and Frack. They were both uh, feral, and uh, Frack was trapped by somebody else and uh, was spayed and showed up on our doorstep. And we had Frick out there at about the same time when we were trying to do the uh, catch, neuter, release program. So the two of them are, are super tight, and they're both outside. Uh, we're committed. If we ever move, they're going to go with us. So... Uh, fear not. Uh, I'm not a big fan of outdoor cats, but it just kind of shook out that, that, that these guys are, are outdoor. And they inhabit our property. That's pretty much their limit. And the two of them are really tight together. So there's there's Frack, and Frick is, is all black. So we're going to talk behavior modification, and uh, let's start with a definition. Uh, you know, this is the use of operant conditioning, biofeedback, modeling, aversion, conditioning, reciprocal inhibition, what have you. All kinds of different techniques inspired by behaviors, theory, and principles. Uh, and we know that behaviorism is, a, is kind of a subset of learning theory, if you will. It's a means of changing behavior. And that's kind of where we're going to go with this assignment. So, for example, behavioral modification is used in clinical contexts, right, to prove adaptation and alleviate symptoms in organizational contexts to encourage employees to adopt safe working practices. That is maybe adjust to new equipment or new policies. The terms often used synonymously with behavior therapy, but behavior modification. And some people uh, shorten it and call it BMOD. So if you ever hear BMOD, they're talking behavior modification. Now these all derive from two basic theories and I'm not going to necessarily, well we got to get into it a little bit because we got to know where it comes from and uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what you were exposed to in Psych 1100. So what we have is a stimulus response consequence model. So we encounter a stimulus, it engenders a response, and that response carries with it a consequence. That's, that's the basics. When we look at B.F. Skinner and, and we look at Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, right, what we see is they're operating on opposite sides of the system. So Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning, whatever terms you want to use, focused on stimulus and response. And we know with the salivating dogs, uh, what happened is the, the salivation was the response, right? And, and we see substitution of stimulus. And, and Pavlov was a phys uh, physiologist, so Given his stature in psychological theory, it's truly amazing, right? Now, operant conditioning is, or you could call it Skinnerian, is the product of B.F. Skinner's work. And B.F. Skinner focused on the other part of the model. That is, uh, how do we reinforce or diminish a response? And that's by manipulating the consequences. So there's a lot to be learned from both for us in terms of changing our own behavior. Uh, obviously, it can be applied to others, but this, like I said, this course is right the story of you and, and your adjustment challenges, your adjustment strategies, and your adjustment successes. So let's let's take a look. The behavior modification techniques, classical conditioning, right? We can do uh, stimulus substitution, non-conscious goal pursuit. We'll talk about in a little bit by Goldwitzer. Operant conditioning. We can manipulate reinforcements or punishments, and we can uh, you know change schedules. Techniques. Well, there's incremental. And, and this is also known as uh, subsequent approximations. Uh, that is, we move towards a goal a small step at a time, each, each step building on the success of the last step. Flooding is a technique that's fallen out of flavor. I mean, <laughs> flavor out of favor, right? Uh, systematic desensitization, aversion therapy, extinction. Let's talk about them. So let's uh, just summarize classical conditioning, kind of, uh, kind of a little review here. Uh, so basically what we had when Pavlov discovered that his dogs would salivate when the research assistant arrived to feed them, you know, before they salivated when they were presented with food or given meat powder, and that would cause a salivation, and that's what Pavlov wanted to study is the digestive properties of, sa of saliva. But they thought the experiment had gone wacky because all of a sudden the dogs are salivating before the meat was presented. And what had happened is the dogs had learned to associate 
the arrival of the assistant with feeding time with the meat so they didn't need the meat to cause the salivation anymore the assistant's presence was enough to trigger that see so it's two stimuli that have been substituted for each other so Pavlov upon discovering this then says oh my god that's crazy and being the true scientist he was an appreciator of the scientific method he says well now I have to create a hypothesis and I have to test it right so we have to then he hypothesizes that he can develop salivation in the dogs in response to a neutral stimulus, a, a stimulus that had no effect on the dog previously, and that is he chose a tone or a bell or what have you. So in this case, Pavlov, prior to conditioning, prior to learning, and anytime you see the word conditioning, you could probably substitute the word learning and be okay. So maybe that'll help clear it up, because the terminology is a little confusing in, in conditioning theory. Right, so we, we produce this neutral tone, the stimulus, and the dog says, hey, I hear a tone, but it doesn't yet cause the salivation. It doesn't cause the targeted response. Now, the unconditioned stimulus, that which occurs in nature, the unlearned stimulus, the natural, the innate stimulus, is the food powder. And I put the food powder in the mouth, and that causes the response of salivation. Notice, this is a non-conscious process. The dog has no control over this. So we do this. We do this, right? But now, as we combine them, we put them together, what we find is when we put them together, the meat powder is still causing the salivation, but over time, with enough repetitions, right, then what we're going to find after conditioning, after learning, is now the tone can elicit the salivation without ever using the meat powder. So this is really what you call stimulus substitution. To unassociated stimuli right and now you associate the stimuli and finally the learned stimuli now has the power to affect the response okay. so what we can do is merely substitute stimuli that cause us to behave in a habitual manner and maybe then exchange one stimuli for the other is the general idea here okay so oh a little joke I think this one's hilarious, right? But but not everyone agrees. Uh, many people accuse psychologists of telling some of the worst jokes in the world. So let's talk about automatic implementation uh, intentions. We're going to go down that list we had. Now, the linking of a situation to a goal, and notice how this has kind of this Pavlovian flavor uh, to d direct a goal uh, encountered behavior. Now, what Golitzer did was he had his students, and this was based on writing an essay over Christmas uh, because it was a semester system where they broke for Christmas, right? And he had half his students just, he told them, hey, you need to bring this essay in with you when you come back. So on the first day of class, after Christmas vacation, bring the essay with you. That's the control condition. Now, the experimental condition was given different instructions. They're told, I want you to associate the writing of the essay with an event that you will know will happen in your future. And so what he said is, I intend to do X when I encounter Y. All right. So how might this work? Well, I intend to read my chapter in my psychology book when I see the credits from Adam 12, which I would watch on TV. And the idea here is what you're doing is taking a natural, so if, if you watch Adam 12, let's say every day on MeTV from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., you're watching those final credits, right? You speak this out loud. I intend to read my psychology textbook chapter when I see the credits of Adam 12. And then you forget about it. So now it's tomorrow and here you are sitting there watching Adam 12 as is your habit and then the credits roll what that's supposed to do is trigger the non-conscious association of reading psychology text to Adam 12 credits and it reminds you then to do it he had great success with this in the essays it was like 25 percent of the students without an implementation intention those in the control condition brought the essay in 75 percent of the students with an implementation intention brought in the essay so it was a huge effect size right but so the idea is simply that we link a desired behavior i will do this right i will do x when i encounter and then you pick out stu some stimulus object that you're likely to encounter right 
note that we may be able to adopt some behaviors almost automatically using this process. And I think that's fascinating, but it really derives from, from classical conditioning, uh, at least in part. Now, Skinner, B.F. Skinner, radical behaviorism, that's what they called it, and he was pretty damn radical. Uh, he's a fascinating man. Uh, and a fascinating theorist, uh, interesting sense of humor too. Skinner's radical behaviorism, and there's a B.F. Skinner Foundation uh, on the internet because there's everything on the internet. But these are people who are, are better behavioral science for a more humane world, and that is by prudent manipulation of rewards and punishments. We may, in fact, then be able to shape behavior uh, in a very positive fashion. And, and this is not without its detractors, right? But Skinner believed that the most powerful influences on behavior are, are what happen after the behavior, its consequences. Right? And, and you can read about the foundation. You can actually go to Skinner.org. You can go to the foundation. There's your link if you wish. And, and check it out if this is of interest to you. But let's define uh, punishments and rewards. We all know from math, right? and, and I think it's important to kind of unpack the language here, it makes it easier to understand. We all know from math, at least for our purposes, positive is to blank and negative is to blank. And what do you think? Okay. Well, that's addition and subtraction. All right. So we can use those terms and, and it becomes, I think, easier to understand the four choices when it comes to operant conditioning. So now let's combine with this the idea that reward is a reinforcement and it's perceived as good. And I think this is where sometimes people's attempts at operant conditioning kind of fall short because one person's reward might be another person's punishment. So we have to look at individual differences. We have to know that the person in question defines the consequence as rewarding or punishing. Right? And I know that sounds kind of strange, right? But for example, let's say that when, well, I mean, for real, uh, when I was in 10th grade, which was the first year of high school, because we had three-year high schools in Los Angeles, right, I, I was put into honors classes. And I went into the honors classes on the first day, and I knew no one there, because all my friends were not honors students, right? And I knew all these people, and, you know, some people say, you've been placed in an honors class, that should be rewarding. Well, to me, it was punishing, because it set me apart from my peers, my, my, my peeps, if you will. Right? So I dropped all those honors courses in a heartbeat and took regular classes where my friends were. I mean, that's not a good decision, but notice that I was interpreting being placed in an honors class more as a punishment than a reward, that it would produce negative consequences rather than positive consequences. And obviously I was doing some very short-term thinking there, and, and I paid the price, right? Those are some choices I made in 10th grade that affected me significantly for a number of years. Now, punishment is perceived as bad. But let's say that when I was in middle school, and I started smoking cigarettes, which was against the rules, and if you were caught with cigarettes, then you would get a SWAT. That's, they'd use corporal punishment, and they use these big paddles, and you'd have to bend over and grab your ankles, and then the vice principal would hit you, right? And it's a punishment. It's designed to be bad, and it's designed to discourage behavior. Well, if you're a smoker, you've got to carry cigarettes, so you're an easy mark. It's easy to find you, and Mr. Lapp and the vice principal or the gym teacher would always find my cigarettes, and then they say, Polifroni, you know, you gotta have a SWAT, and I go, oh, cool, wonderful, I have a SWAT, right? But the, the thing is, they didn't understand. You know, you get your SWAT, and then you go out into the hallway or wherever else you run into all your friends, and they say, dude, did you get another SWAT? And I'm going, yeah, Lapping gave me another SWAT, man. That dude's totally got it in for my ass, you know? And everyone laughs, but see, so your status and your popularity increase. So while the SWAT is somewhat punishing, right, the, the result of the SWAT, that is the, the status increase, was actually rewarding. So they were engaging in an activity which I viewed more as a reward than a punishment, so it was going to be ineffective in stopping the smoking behavior, right? So you, if you want to use operant conditioning and manipulate rewards and punishments, make sure, in fact, that the person that you're operating on right, regards it as a reward or a punishment in the same manner that you do. Now, let's talk about then the four kinds of consequences, and, and here's the deal. Remember I said you can add or subtract? And rewards could be called good, 
and punishment's bad. So you've got four choices. Do the two by two. You can add good. You can subtract good. You can add bad. You can subtract bad. Th that's your four possibilities. And here's your handy-dandy cheat sheet and how this works. Positive is to add. Negative is to subtract. What's our goal? Do we want to increase the behavior or do we want to see a decrease in the behavior? So for maybe you want to, you know, increase your studying, right? But maybe you want to decrease uh, some distracting activity like video game playing to, to a manageable level so it doesn't interfere with your studying. Your choice, whatever you want to do, maybe you want to decrease behavior in eating bad food, fad, food that might not serve you well, right? Sugary or, or, or fatty food necessarily. But, okay, so I want to increase behavior, and in my toolkit, I want to add a positive. So that means I'm using positive reinforcement. I'm adding good, right? So how might that work in the workplace? Well, you give, uh, you give someone a bonus for working hard. leads to more hard work. Right? Just like they're doing for us lectures at Ohio State during COVID. We have to work twice as hard. So what are they doing? They're paying us the same and shortening our contract. Not, not good operant conditioning principles, right? They should be giving us freaking bonuses or some such. Uh, yeah, fat chance. Anyway, subtract negative. Now, negative reinforcement is one of the tougher ones to understand. What I'm going to do is subtract bad. So maybe my employee does a bang-up job this month, and one of their jobs is to clean the restrooms, and I don't have money to give them a bonus or something. So I say, you know what? Instead of adding good, adding a bonus, which I can't do, how about I subtract bad? How about, you don't like cleaning the restrooms, do you? You know you don't like cleaning the restrooms? I'll tell you what, for the whole next month, I will clean the restrooms so you don't have to. Notice what I did is I subtracted bad, but the net result is they're better off. They've been rewarded as a result of subtracting bad. Now, aspirin, relieving headache, leads to more aspirin use. Think about this. Oh, I got a headache, right? I take an aspirin. That's the behavior. I take the aspirin. The headache goes away bad has been subtracted it will increase the aspirin use in the future anytime I have a headache right now positive punishment to decrease behavior this is when you add bad positive add right punishment bad add bad so you're speeding along the highway the police officer pulls you over and says I got something for you and you say what do you have for me and they say I'm gonna add bad to your life I'm gonna give you a ticket which is going to cost you money, right? So, negative punishment is taking away something desirable. Taking away good, right? In this case, missing dinner leads to uh, less staying out late. So, your teenager comes home and they say, wow, what's for dinner? And you say, dinner was excellent, you know? And you tell them what you had for dinner, and we did that at 6 p.m. Notice it's 7 p.m. now. I'm sorry, no dinner for you. That is taken away good right in essence to make them come home earlier so that they arrive for dinner all right so we got enough now uh, of conditioning theory to talk about exploring homework three now as we move that way let's look at incrementing I gotta jump ahead guys oh shit 